I am built to be entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. I am built to respect everybody and fear nobody. Mm -hmm. I am not afraid to be a head coach, to, to meet the president, to stand up at a rally for my black and brown friends. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of any of that. Mm -hmm. But like, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, let's do, Nancy, why don't we go skydiving? I'm like, just send me the film. You draw the line no. at heights. <laughs> no, I'm like, no, I'm mitigating my risk. Of course, yeah. No, I've got two puppies at home. <laughs> they need me. <laughs> yes, they, they like to eat. <laughs> but that's the stuff like, you would never have known in your career because right. it's going to happen to you. Yeah. It will happen. I know this. Well, that's like, saying a lot coming from you. I, I know the path mm -hmm. and that's called experience. Oh, wait, wait, real quick. Are you guys, you guys are all good. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I just wanted to make sure we were all good. Yeah, we them girls. We shouted from the top, top, top. Yeah, we them girls. You know we never stop, stop, stop. We laughing haters out the way. Nancy, I look at my career and I like trace everything back. I've been working with you for a year now, like sitting next to you. And every time I sit next to you, I am still wowed in the fact that I look at my upbringing playing basketball, the AAU that I played, the college career I had, and now the career that I have. And at every single point, I'm like, I could probably trace it back to something that Nancy did to pave the way for me to do what I did. And so I'm just all, I just want you to know, even, even doing this for a year now, I'm still like, wow, I get to sit next to Nancy Lieberman at the uh, desk. That is like super sweet. Um, it really is. And it's never lost on me. Um, I pride myself on being a good human and fun. And, you know, you're mm -hmm. studying your notes and I'm like <laughs> making some joke about something. And I go, did you hear me? <laughs> and you're like, D -d -d -d, you know, tapping away. I think humor brings people together. Mm -hmm. Like my smile yeah. <laughs> makes you smile. It does. It does. It doesn't cost anything. And somebody mentored me. Um, when we just recently lost Billy Moore, mm -hmm. the Hall of Fame coach, who was my coach on the 76 Olympic team, I've had a chance, you know, so many people heap so much kindness and love on me. But, you know, I was 18, 17, 16 mm -hmm. at some point. And, you know, Ann Myers and Pat Summit, yep. uh, Lucy Harris. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't believe Lucy Harris was my teammate. I was a junior in high school and a senior in high school when we won the Pan Am yeah. gold and the uh, Olympic silver in 76 and 80, excuse me, 75 and 76. So I still have that, wow. I mean, like Ann Myers texted me the other night and I'm just, you know, she's four years older than me. Mm -hmm. She was one of the captains on the Olympic team. Julene Simpson, who you've probably never heard of, she was the captain of the Olympic team. And Jules will forever be my captain. Mm. And you know, like everybody has their vet. Yep. Lucy was my vet. And Lucy would say, Nancy, you know, she's very quiet. Very quiet, yeah. She said, you're probably gonna get killed by us. I said, oh, okay, Th is, that's not good. She goes, uh, you, you got too much energy. I said, because you're old and I'm young and I just want somebody to play ball with me, like football, baseball, basketball. I was at the Super Bowl, okay. you know, I got there on Saturday and uh, you know, they were recognizing me with, uh, uh, Lee Steinberg was recognizing me at this beautiful affair with, with a humanitarian award. Can I just pause right here? Because this is, this is worth noting. The amount of awards that you've won this year have been jaw dropping. You have a statue now at Old Dominion. You've got Nancy Lieberman Pass in, in Virginia, the humanitarian award at the Super Bowl. I mean, it's incredible. It's incredible. It's, uh, it's humbling. Sometimes uh, I'm not demeaning myself, but sometimes it's like, oh my God, I think, uh, like how did that happen? Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I go straight back to when I was 19, 20 years old, when I, I met my hero, Muhammad Ali. Like at 10, like I said, I didn't know if I was gonna kill you, but I didn't know if I was gonna kill me. It took me a long time to actually utter those words in public. Mm -hmm. And 
it was later in my life, you know, like in my 40s when I was comfortable with who I am. And uh, I fell in love with Muhammad Ali. I mean, I studied him, yeah. which then gave me the courage to, you know, try out for the U.S. team, to go to college, to get a scholarship. Wow. Yeah. But this is what Ali told me that night of December in New York City at the New York Stock Exchange. We were the two athletes, the headliners. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't breathe. It was in 1979. Wow. And, and after we met and we talked, he just sensed that I was, I was damaged, mm. you know, from my childhood. And he asked me and my mom and my best friend Barbara to come back to the plaza, to his suite. And mm -hmm. we spent about three, four hours with him. And he would just sit there and he'd go, Nancy, I'm gonna tell you about racism. I'm gonna tell you about philanthropy. I was like, what's that word? <laughs> Philanthro what? <laughs> What'd you call me? <laughs> um, he, he just took me down a path of information. Yeah. And he kept saying, God made you special. And you know how mature I am. I went, you know God too? You know everybody. That's amazing, Muhammad. I, I mean, I was, he goes, you're gonna change the world. You're gonna help my people. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, and he started telling me about, you know, how African-Americans sometimes feel less because of the darkness or the color of their skin or how they've been treated. And I, and I looked at him and I went, my, my, my friends, my, my friends are hurting. Mm -hmm. Like, like my guys are hurting. Like I'm with them every day. They seem really happy. I, I didn't get it, mm -hmm. but he just put this on me. He goes, you're gonna change culture. Yeah. And I had no clue what he was talking about. And so, you know, as time goes and you fast forward to where we are today, I never thought like, you know, I'm a conservative person, um, my values, I never thought that I would be a social racial activist um, using the strength of my relationships and uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, things like that, the Martin Luther King Civil Rights Award, I was like, I'm on the stage there with the Grizzlies, and I'm like, I got a question. That's not good, Nancy's got a question. <laughs> I'm like, am I the first white person to get this award in 20 years? I'm like, shame, shame on us. You know, I mean, we should be doing things for each other to help each other. I mean, you know I'm a white girl. I know you're African-American. Mm -hmm. I want the best for you. Right. And the fact that the thunder would put us together and pair us, everything in my life has, has moments and epiphanies. I am so grateful that they have allowed us yeah. this year. Mm -hmm. You know, some, some people might think it's a leap of faith. It's not a leap of faith. We are the right person at the right job, yeah. at the right time, and we were blessed by the right organization. You were a point guard, I was a point guard. The amount of ball that we can just talk is amazing to me. And the fact that I get to do that with a fellow, like a, a woman too, like there's just, there's a connection there that I, I, I love having up there on the desk, just being able to riff on some basketball. Yeah, we're a little unscripted, aren't we? A little we? bit. <laughs> that makes for good TV, though. <laughs> but it's like you could see something. Your knowledge yeah. is ridiculous and off the charts. And like I'll listen to what you're saying or how you're breaking down a play. And that, like you're saying, innately, it allows us to yeah. just, you know, pick up on each other's sentences, mm -hmm. you know. And when you have that chemistry with somebody, it's very special. Mm -hmm. and, and then when you like the person you work with. Exactly. Because there's a lot of people in life you're gonna work with that you're actually not gonna like. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from experience. <laughs> but you know, this is, this is a great job. Yeah. It's a great organization. Mm -hmm. I love the culture. Mm -hmm. It matches up with the person that I am. Yeah. And it makes me feel good. And here's something else interesting. While we have a lot of similarities in terms of our, you know, perspective, we also have a lot of differences, right? Like I grew up with Candace Parker and Diana Taurasi, Sue Bird. Those were my those were my 
idols at the time. Those are the ones I wanted to be. I don't know why I thought I was gonna be like 6'3", like Candace Parker. I just, that was part of my dream as well. Um, but, and you had completely different role models that, that you looked up to. I wanna do a little compare and contrast. Okay. I'm curious about this. AAU, when you played, what was, what was AAU like for you? AAU, I played in Harlem. Uh, I played with the New York Chuckles. Remember Chuckles Candy? Oh, wow, yeah. It was like, it was, I was always like this. You know what <laughs> I played uh, for, my coach was Lavoise Lamar. Wow. He was like a 350 pound African American guy with a big afro and the mud chops. Oh, wow. And he would drive his silver Toyota, and his seat was so far back. And it was, I mean, I felt like I was in Snoop's car. Oh my God. And it was bouncy. He would come to my house and pick me up. Really? And take me into Manhattan and take me into parks mm -hmm. to play AAU. And it was, it was amazing. Like um, Carol Blaisdowski, Hall of Famer, played at Montclair State. Um, she would play, but Predominantly, it, it was African American, mm -hmm. but so my heroes were like Walt Frazier, you know, yep. Julia Serving because Julia's played at Rucker, uh, Willis Reed, yep. because he was like the captain. Everybody looked up to Willis, man of few words. Mm -hmm. But you remember, you know, limping out of the tunnel in the garden uh, for that mm -hmm. series against uh, Will Chamberlain. So, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have. I had Ali. Yeah. That was it. I didn't have a vision of a woman yeah. who I could aspire to. No, I did watch Billie Jean in the Battle of the Sexes. Did you? Yeah, I watched that and I was amazed that she was playing Bobby Riggs. Yeah. Like I see the whole thing, like the 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 um, documentaries now, mm -hmm. and and the fact that Billie Jean King is a super duper friend of mine, and I like. Like, you know how you're like showing me like kindness, love, respect? Yeah, yeah. Like I get with Billie Jean and I get fidgety <laughs> and I get nervous. Do you get quiet, Nancy? Yes. <laughs> it's hard to believe. It is. <laughs> but it's the same thing with Walt Frazier. Yeah. Like we've known each other now for since the early 80s. And every time like at the Hall of Fame or at an event and yeah. I'm like. <laughs> and he's like, hey, girl. And I'm like. Starstruck. Oh, hi, Walt. And, and then number 10, you know, we did this on yeah, the show. Yeah, number 10, uh-huh. Um, I sit like at the Hall of Fame. Me, uh, make me a pinky swear. Uh, I'll do my best. Um, next year, uh -huh. you'll come to as my guest at the Basketball Hall of Fame for enshrinement. You heard it here. You heard her say it. I'm going to But the behind the scene, you'll go okay. behind the yes. scenes where, yes. where all the Hall of Famers go. Absolutely. I will fly you out there. Okay. I'll get you a room. And you'll be my guest for enshrinement. Look at all that you've done now. When you were in Queens, New York, looking for looking for someone to go play hoops with, would you ever think that this would be the legacy that you'd be building up to this point? You could never think that. I mean, I was, you know, I was growing up to survive. Mm. You know, like I've met your parents. Mm -hmm. And so you had such a stable environment yeah. growing up. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a stable environment. Like um, I didn't have, my father left when I was eight. Mm -hmm. So I had no father, we had no food, we had no heat, we had no electricity. We were one grandparent away from food stamps. And I had an angry childhood mm -hmm. uh, in Queens. You know, I talked like this, how you doing, yeah. you know. And I, I was just so, I was always angry because like, my backpack, uh, which I try to save yours all the time, because you I'm did. from New York and she leaves I, her I leave backpack. I leave my backpack around. And, and I'm like, you can't do that. Somebody will steal it. She's, but I know it's in good hands because you're right there. You're going to beat up anybody that tries to steal my backpack. It's probably true. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, my backpack was a brown paper garbage bag and my pencil bag was a brown paper sandwich bag and people would make fun of me. So. I didn't have conflict resolution. So I would, I was beating everybody up. Right. And you know, the school's calling Ms. Lieberman, Nancy had been in another fist fight. And she was like, you can't beat everybody up. I'm like, they make fun of me and they make fun of me because I'm playing with the boys mm -hmm. and they make fun of me because my friends are black mm -hmm. and they're my friends. And I, they're telling me that's what, 
not what little white girls, Jewish white girls do. And so at eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, I didn't realize that I was teaching my mother not to be judgmental, not wow. to be racist, because marching in my house mm -hmm. were people that didn't look like me, boys. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Ma, this is Ronald Donald, this is Gary. Um, we're hungry, could you make us some spaghetti? And you know, she's like, how do you guys know each other? I said, we won three games. <laughs> we're best you know, friends now. <laughs> okay, you're, you, know, you know how you hit the first foul shot, yep. the first five people line up? Mm -hmm. Like when I went to Rucker Park? Uh, Rucker Park. I would take $2, kids don't do this. <laughs> I took $2 out of my mom's wallet because I didn't have money. And I said, I'm going to the park. Well, PS 104 was across the street where I went to. That's where you went to school? Yeah, okay. that, you know, that's elementary school. So that's where I grew up playing ball. And so I would go out and I'd go into Far Rockaway and get on the, the A train, mm -hmm. uh, take the A train into Manhattan, uh, change trains to the E, and then get off at 155th and Malcolm X Boulevard. And I'd walk into Rucker Park. I was 11. <laughs> I had t-shirts in my jacket, and I'm like, what you looking at? And people would go back to their newspaper. I'm like, you looking at me? Because I wanted to do it to them before they did it to me. I would be so scared of you, even at 11 years old, if I saw you. I was this little skinny, so red hair. But it was cool, the kids in the park, they're like, little girl, are you lost? And I went, no, are you? I said, is your name Rucker? He says, no. I said, good, it ain't your park. And I want to play, and I need somebody to help me. I need to be good. And they go, where did you come from? I said, Far Rockaway. They said, that's a 50-minute two-train ride. I said, yeah, my mom don't know I'm here. These guys protected me. Wow. They taught me the city game. They beat the tar out of me with love. But that you needed that, right? They, they toughened me up, and I'm so grateful. They just had this amazing show last summer, Point Gods, uh -huh. it, the, it, uh, 35 Ventures, uh, it, you know, Ke Kevin Durant's company, mm -hmm. uh, and it played on Showtime, and they had the uh, premiere in New York. And when they called me and they said, we've selected the 30, uh, 17 or 18 greatest point guards in the history of New York City basketball, and you're one of them. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that is so cool. I mean, we're talking about Sham God. I've played against Sham God. Wow. Well, he was Sham Godding me. <laughs> I was about to get in a fist fight. <laughs> you can't do that against me, man. Uh, you know, I've played against Skip to my Lou, wow. uh, Ray for Alston. Yeah. I've played against Arnold Duggar. I mean, there's so many of, you know, Joe Hammond. Uh -huh. You know, uh, Joe Hammond didn't go to the NBA because he was getting so much money in the streets, he had like two, three hundred thousand dollars in a shoebox under his bed yeah. in Harlem. Oh my goodness. You know, I yeah. mean, and he was like, why should I go to the NBA? I make more on the streets. So, you know, it, it, it was so cool. Like I'd play in the men's Rucker Summer League. Mm. Okay. They put me yeah. in a perch one day. It had to be 1979. Nate Archibald and I, they built a tree house. You've seen where like people are hanging from the trees, the top of buildings at Rucker, because there's just thousands of people in the park. Yeah. And Joe Hammond is like the legend of legends. Mm -hmm. We played outdoors. It was metal backboards with the little holes in it. Yeah. Uh, I don't even know if they had a net that day. They might have taped a net up. Goodness. The ball, you know, why, why are New York City point guards penetrators? Because you can be shooting in the wind, they'll take your shot. <laughs> you got to get to the rim. <laughs> we're, you know, all the Kenny Anderson, yeah, yeah. Mark Jackson, we were all penetrators mm -hmm. to the basket. And then when they collapse, you know, boom, and then, you know, you, you throw it down, you give it to somebody who dunks it. And, uh, <laughs> He had 87 points, that oh guy, Joe gosh. Hammond. Yeah, my, we played him, and I played with on the team with another schoolyard legend, um, Arnold Duggar, mm -hmm. he, who's no longer with us. And they started me, people were oohing and I Okay, I did the first game up in the booth with, uh, I forget who I did it with, but Nate Archibald and I, and an ESPN commentator, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they actually built a, a tree house. And then somebody said, hey, do you want to play in the second game Joey Hammond's playing? And I said, I don't have anything. They got sneakers, shorts, 
a T-shirt from people in the crowd. What? Yes. And I play in the crowdsourced an outfit for yes. you. <laughs> and I played oh in the gosh. second game, and it was a, like I don't know. They sent me the box score where I had like 15 points or whatever, and I was like, we had box scores. <laughs> 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 Who knew? I've never seen a box score. That's pretty impressive. Unbelievable. Now I'm, I'm curious about what was college recruiting. That, that journey like for you? It's a great question. So you've seen- Cause you ended up at, at Old Dominion. Right. Which is, how far is that from where, where you grew up in Queens? Seven, seven hour drive. Seven hour drive, okay. Okay, so you had your five visits or you-, uh, I, you I had have. five, yeah, I went, I went to one. Okay. In 1974, when I hit the scene, yeah. trying out at the US tryouts, it was like America's Got Talent. It wow. was split into four areas okay. of the country, and there was a blurb in the um, Long Island Press, and it said, tryouts, Russia playing three-game exhibition against the U.S. women's team, and it had the dates, tryouts. Mm -hmm. So a bunch of my kids, friends from uh, high school and AAU, um, we loaded him up into Mr. Aida's car, and we went to Queens College. There were 250 girls. I was 15 years old. You should have seen me. And I'm like, okay. They put a, a number on a you, number, like a yeah. running. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then after every hour or so, they would post the numbers that were still on. Wow. So they'd put you in drills. Yep. Um, these were high school, all Americans. Mm -hmm. it, w women had graduated. At the end of the day, six, seven at night, they took 20 players. We had a big scrimmage. Mm -hmm. Whoever wanted to hang around and watch it, and then they picked 10 to go to Albuquerque, New Mexico to a three-day pre-camp. So they took 10 from four uh -huh. tryouts. So 40 women, I was one of the 10. Wow, so out of what, what was it? 250. 250, yeah. I go home, I'm like, mom, 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 you're not gonna believe this. I'm going to Albuquerque, New Mexico. She goes, Nancy, like hell you are. Wow. And I'm like, why? She goes, Nancy, I don't have money to fix dinner. How am I gonna get you on an airplane? So my high school, uh, assistant principal, Barbara Sackowitz, took a can of corn, opened it, cleaned it, ripped the label off, put an envelope and said, we're endeavoring to raise $300 to send Nancy to the Olympic trials. This can went all over my neighborhood and they had enough money in it to send me and my high school coach, Larry Morse. So I go to the pre-camp. After three days, they picked 10 of the 40 to go to the camp that had the Pat Summits and my, the All-Americans. Really? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I was one of the 10. Wow. I was like, I, I, I mean, I have no frame of reference. So my second day, I got hit by an elbow and I broke my ribs. And so they're taking me to the airport to go home and the coach, is uh, in, they're kind of like the manager and the coach. And uh, Alberta Cox, I'm sitting in the back and she goes, now Nancy. I said, yes, coach. And she goes, now you go home and you work hard. I said, yes, ma'am. She goes, we're gonna need you in 1980. And I went, like coach, I'm not like really smart or nothing uh, cause I'm from New York, but I know 76 comes before 80. <laughs> And I'm gonna be on the 80 Olympic, the 76 Olympic team, so I just hope you'll get used to me and, and thank you for the opportunity. You're telling me what I can't be? Wow. Who does that? Yeah. I went home and every time I was tired, exhausted, I'd be like, now honey, we'll wait, you know, 1980, and I keep going. Mm -hmm. And then the next year I try out for the Pan Am. Mm -hmm. I make that. So here's the answer to your question. AIAW yeah. mm -hmm. is not root beer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you might need to spell out some of these leagues for some it's folks. The Association <laughs> of Intercollegiate Athletics for, for Women. women. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, every time I went to one of these USA tryouts, like in Warrensburg, Missouri, yeah. or some. All the college coaches were there. So that was like the exposure, the big exposure event. And I was the only high school kid, so everybody was like, now what's your name? Wow. And what I did was I asked people, 
and I knew a little bit from the, the training camp for two days, and I said, like, who's the best player here? And they said, well, Ann Myers. I said, where is she? And they said, she's over there. If she stopped short, she was going to hit me. I guarded her in every drill, every possession, because I figured, you know, she's the best player. Yeah. If somebody stops her, they're going to want to know who, who's who the kid. Yeah. And then the other thing that was huge, I was 5'8". And I was like the carnival monkey <laughs> at Rucker Park. They'd go fire because of my flaming red hair. They go fire. I'm like, yes. They go hang on the rim. I'm like, okay. And I would hang on the rim. They'd say, fire, you can come down now. Okay. I could dunk a tennis ball. What? So we do layup lines. Well, I, hold on. That's a big deal, Nancy. You could dunk I, a tennis ball? Yeah, I could dunk a tennis ball. Like, I was so athletic. I was young and dumb. Like, I didn't know terminologies. You, were, you had raw talent, just like straight oh, raw talent. I was talent. street ball. Yeah. I was diving into tables. If there was a loose ball, yeah. that's why my teammates were going to kill me. <laughs> because Lucy Harris, like, you can't just dive, you know, 10 feet into a pile. You're going to hurt one of us. Right, right. I know, but I thought I could get the ball. Like, Ann Myers, this is, uh, Annie, I hope you don't watch this. I would let Annie get by me on a fast break. And then, remember the backboards were lower? They were, uh-huh. Okay? Uh-huh. So the guys now can hit their heads. They raised them. I would let her get by me. And then I'd run, and I'd pin her shot on the backboard. Goodness. And I'd be like... And she would get so mad at me. So you just let her go? I would just let her go. And, my, and, like, the coaches were like... So you got everyone's attention easily. Because of athleticism. Yeah, they weren't seeing that at that time. No, I, I mean, like I said, I screwed up every offense. Oh, yeah. Plays were not a, th yeah, pro probably not a good thing for not you. Not for me. <laughs> well, we're going to run uh, the 1-3-1 one, one zone and we're going to uh, morph into a 2-3. I'm like, what's what? that? Is a 2, no, that is, that, I don't do math. I play basketball. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not good. Uh, but Billy Moore, the yeah. Olympic. Okay, so that's how I saw all the coaches. They were all coming up. Yeah. So uh, where are you going to go? And it was almost like you had, you know, bro brochures for yeah. a vacation. Mm -hmm. And people would give me a Hand brochure, your brochure from your yep. school. Yep. So I had over 100 offers. From that one camp? From that one? From um, the Pan Am, Pan Am and the Olympic training. Goodness gracious. And so, I, like, I... I always thought of myself as an underdog. So I would go, oh, what's your record this year? Oh, we were 29 and three. Okay, thank you, I'm not interested. Uh, what What is your record? Oh, you were three and 22. Can I look at your brochure? I, Old Dominion was like six and 29. I mean, uh, You UCLA, wanted to be on an underdog team. Delta State. Of course, yeah. Um, L, um, Stephen F. Austin. Like those, Tennessee, those Tennessee. are all the big mm -hmm. schools. But I, you know, I wanted to go to Cal State Fullerton because that's where Billy Moore went, my coach. Oh, okay, okay. But then she was honest and she said, Nancy, you know, I might take another job, which she ended up at UCLA for Got you. 100 years. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't be stranded in California with no money. All by yourself. And that's the clear cross other side of the country. Yeah. And so I looked at schools that, didn't do well, but I could drive home. Okay, and that's why... Old Dominion. Old Dominion stuck out to you. You talk about going to an underdog program. You took them to championships. Well, because when we got, like we, like I said, we were 6 and 29. Yeah. Seven freshmen. We oh my We show up at Old Dominion. Wow. We're in the locker room. And I, I look at my seven freshmen, and I go... Right, I'm big on the pinky swear. It means really? <laughs> it means something to me. It will to you okay, too. Yes, it will. <laughs> and I go, I'm taking Debbie Richards' job. Who are you? I'm taking Yvette Baggett's job. I'm taking Wendy Larry's job. Wendy was who coached Old Dominion. Oh wow! All time winningest coach there, and she coached Penichero and all those guys yeah. in the in the 90s. We we took every upperclassmen's job. I say, you know, we should retire them. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I was so no filter. None. Yeah. Like, let's just make them retire and work on their academics. <laughs> it's that easy. I mean, come on. But we go, we go 23 and nine, we get into the top 10. We yeah. play Delta State. Two of our losses were Delta State Immaculata. In that first year. First year. 
The truth? Immaculata, yeah, that that was a big deal program. Who, Delta State had won two national championships. Immaculata had won prior to them three yeah. in a row. I was a little upset because we go to play Immaculata at Immaculata, you know, it's a, a Catholic school with the nuns. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm like, we're going to kill them. They're wearing skirts. <laughs> Do not overestimate how good a girl can be in a skirt. The reason why they're three-time champions. <laughs> and they're sitting behind the nuns, sit behind you on a wooden gym, and they have like these bang. I'm like, you got to stop that. <laughs> the whole game, bang, 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 bang. And we lost. Yeah. We lost the girls in skirts. How close? Was it close? It was 10 points. Yeah, yeah. Drove me crazy. Still bothers me. Obviously, I'm talking clearly, about clearly. it. <laughs> I need Not to... bitter at all. Do, does the team have like a psychologist that it can work we, with? We set you up. We got you. Okay, so we we win the NIT the next year. Okay. We go 30 and four. Mm -hmm. I missed a shot at North Carolina against NC State mm -hmm. to send us home. I missed the game-winning shot. Yeah. I go back to Old Dominion in the newspaper like back then, the Virginia pilot, there was like, at this port point, the goat wasn't the goat. Yeah. The goat was like, Gina Beasley was like the hero mm -hmm. and I was the goat and it, our pictures. Mm -hmm. And we were roommates on the USA team. And I'm like, that's gonna never happen to me again. Mm -hmm. Nobody will ever do that to me again. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and then we go 37 and one. Yeah. We win the national championship. Then we go 35 and one, win the national championship. So we had won the NIT in two national. We go 125 and 15. Goodness. In in you know four, four years. years, and it really like we were selling out. Like Pat Summit, we beat them in 80 for the championship. We beat them by 18, and we're doing the hug it up line. And, and you know Pat was my teammate, and mm -hmm. she hugs me and she goes, "What does it feel like?" I said, it feels amazing, Pat, and you're going to win championships now that I'm leaving. You, I wasn't, I struggled with that. You did, goodness gracious, to Pat that, Summit. And now that, now that I'm gone, you're going to have an opportunity. Goodness. <laughs> and she was like, you remember the time we were hugging it up and you said, when I leave now? And look at how many championships she's won as a as a coach yeah, now. I yeah, I mean, it was yeah. amazing. I think what she's won seven, the, seven or eight. I think so. I and lost she track. She's won eleven, I yeah, believe. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it, like that's probably the gamesmanship. Yeah. You know, where I wasn't even trying to be like funny. I was actually that's being honest. Are, right? <laughs> I am so dominant that, yes, now that I'm gone, <laughs> you all have a chance. <laughs> but wait, I'm curious. I'm curious because you mentioned it during that, was it was it the Pan Am when you were just like diving on the floor, they were calling you fire and you were just, just out there with reckless, reckless athleticism. Had your game sharpened up at ODU? Oh my gosh. So I was a power, I played center in high school. So, did, okay, I, not in high school, but I did play like leading up to high school. Yeah, yeah, because you're 5'8", and that was like time. tall, yeah. Then on the USA team, I was a power forward. I tried out as a power forward. I recognized shortly I was not a power forward. Okay. They sl slid me down to like shooting, yeah. like a shooting guard. Uh -huh. I, I did not have a great shot. Okay. Because Rucker Park, <laughs> we don't shoot threes. It was like more flat. Yeah. There was no arc. Right. But I could whip passes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just an art. Yeah. And um, and little by little, by the time I got to Old Dominion, my freshman year, they said you're going to be the point guard, and it was so funny. Um, like Marianne Stanley was coaching and she's like, okay, just come by the bench and I'll give you the play. And I'm like, okay. And so Ing and Ann Donovan, two all Americans, hall of famers, the rebound. And I said, Hey, when you get the rebound, I'll be on the right side of the floor. And Ing goes, that's opposite the bench. I went, yes. <laughs> and I would get it <laughs> and come down and she's like, no, you're the, I'm like, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. And we would run our stuff. Oh my God. And then she, but it was weird. She learned to trust me. It's so interesting how 
your your experience, you needed to get to those the Pan Am and and those events to make sure that you were exposed. Versus when I was coming up in AAU, we had EYBL, which Nike flight, like you travel all over the country in one summer. Like you just, with your team, you go all over the country and coaches are just lining the baseline. It's a game of, ooh, what coach is down there today? Oh, I saw Gino yesterday. Oh, I saw I saw Pat Summit the other day. Or like, it, it's just a game of what, what coaches you'll see. But they were, you could be on this team and be in part of this exposure tournament. And I went to Belmont, which was, an hour from my house in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and I took one trip, loved it, said this is where I'm, this is where I'm going to end up, and stayed there for four years. But it's so crazy how it was. It was probably like there were a lot of women who didn't get to go to that exposure camp, but the pool now it seems like it's so much easier to get to these tournaments that happen all over the country. We went to Virginia, we went to Boo Williams. That, that was like our right. big, yeah, our big one. Um, Nike Nationals down in Augusta, Georgia, just big, big Adidas. tournament. Adidas, yeah, these, and they're huge. They're just big blowout events now. Mm -hmm. And they happen every year, sometimes twice, like there are multiple events every year. But now it's like, if you're, if you're talented, they'll find you, right? Like that's- And film. And film. And YouTube. And I mean, if you, like you said, I've, I was watching Zion Williamson yeah. when he was 12 years old. <laughs> I mean, I was watching him on YouTube. Uh -huh. He was an Emmanuel Moutier. Yep. And I, like at 12, yeah. uh, you know, I was playing at PS 104, you know? My mom, my, my dad would bring a camera to every one of my games. Every single, he would be the camera dad because he had his little tripod, he had his backpack with his camera, and every game, he would record every single game start to finish, and my mom would edit a video and put it together, and it would go up on YouTube. And it's like, that's, that's, that's the exposure. That's how it, how it changed. I would have loved to have played like in this age mm -hmm. like I would have played for coach dag all day oh long because yeah. you just there's so much joy mm -hmm. in how he coaches and he has he has a system that has like options for like you run a you run one option and it's got three different options off of it if this is open you hit that if that's not open dribble at back door like the there's so much more rhythm and flow within a play call. We were more robotic. Uh, this is what you do. This is a UCLA high post, and you know yeah. you can pin down or you can up screen, mm -hmm. and the, the 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 big will pop out, and then we converse it to the. Yeah. Today's game is we we are feeling don't like I I would always tell my players don't play the play, play the game. Uh. You know, people. If you're playing the play, it might not be there, but exactly. You know, I had a player in uh, the WNBA, a Stu Njai, and I love her. Mm -hmm. But she w only wanted to please the coaches. This is my first coaching job uh, in 98 with the Shock. And we kept running a side screen roll, and they would trap it, you know, the defense. Mm -hmm. So um, I said to Sandy Brondello, mm -hmm. who is my point guard, mm -hmm. I said, Sandy, just you know, reverse the basketball, yeah. but go over to where a stew is. Well, the play was to set a side, side screen. And here comes a stew running over to set the screen. Doing her job. Doing her job. Yes. A stew, the ball's over there. <laughs> oh, coach, but you, you said, yeah, and yeah. you know, it's like, don't play the play. Yeah. Play the game. That, yeah. It don't, might break down. That was one of the biggest lessons that I had. Because I was polar opposite of you, Nancy. Like, where you grew up playing in Rucker Park and just, like, hooping, playing with the dudes. I grew up on, I want a play call, and I want to run it to perfection. And I will run it to perfection because I'm the point guard, and I'll make sure that this play is run well. We're going to, everybody's going to be in their spot, and we're going to run it right. And that's, and I would run into the same problem. Well, they're they're trapping you every time you come across half court or every time you make that first pass and you go and it, they read it. They know what they're going to do. You have to, you got to have some feel and some rhythm out there. That was the hardest lesson that I had to learn. And the way my dad helped me out with that, he said, just 
Let's come on. We're going to the we're going to the community center, and you're just gonna go play with these dudes. Play just pick up. just go play pickup. Just ball. Put your name on the list, and I was like, well, I don't know these people. They don't know like what what we uh, like. Paris, there are no plays <laughs> in, in street ball. That's the point. They're not gonna know what they're not gonna know what fist means. They're not gonna do horns for you. No, <laughs> like just go out there and, and play. And when I tell you that was so much fun, and I gained so much confidence as a player, just going out there to our local community center and just putting my name on the list, I was terrified. I wasn't as fearless. I was so scared. And this is just, this is a very nice community center. These are <laughs> lovely people. <laughs> like, if I fell down, somebody's helping me up, picking me up. I'll never forget one play. My dad tells me this story all the time. It was before I was going to um, try out for USA Basketball. And my dad was like, we got we to gotta get you over to the community center. We're going to get your confidence up. We're going to build your confidence. And I'm like, nervous. Like, going to the community center, I am nervous, which, like, I shouldn't have been. It's just about having fun. But I'm over there, and I sign up, and I'm playing against, like, 40-year-olds, 30-year-olds, just, like, I'm 14 at the time. And I get the ball. I come across half court. This 30-year-old man comes and picks me up. I hit him with a in and out cross he falls and I just I shoot it <laughs> and I make it and the whole gym shuts down they just start hitting the horn like game over game over and I'm like what we got to get back on defense come on let's go like we got to keep going and afterwards my dad was like oh my gosh do you know what you just did I was like they didn't keep playing like why were the why did they why did they stop and I was like the this is not how you play basketball. The game's still going. It's like, no, Paris, 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 Paris. That's, that's big. Like, that was a big time play. And thank goodness we were at this very nice community center because that man could have easily tried to dunk on you <laughs> on the other end of the floor or pay you back for what you just did to him. But that, that whole experience gave me so much confidence going into what was like a really big deal trying out for USA Basketball. It makes such a big difference. It's huge. The Everything in life is about confidence. Mm -hmm. True confidence, not false confidence. And so in your story, um, yeah. I remember Candace uh, Parker, who Love I've known Candace her. Parker. I've known her since she tore her ACL and I called ESPN and I said, give me this kid's number. Mm. And her mother tells me the story that Candace was on the floor, on her back with her legs on the couch, giddy. And I pick, and she goes, it's Nancy Lieberman. She goes, she goes, it was like she was talking to her bestie. Oh my goodness. And her feet were kind of yeah. like going like this. <laughs> Just like she's like on the bed, like Gavin, yeah. <laughs> it, I was like, that is so cool. So. She is a freshman at Tennessee. Uh -huh. The season hasn't started. She's playing pickup with the men's team and yeah, other yeah. guys. Well, she went baseline, came around and dunked it, and cell phones were going off yeah, all yeah. over America. I remember this. I saw this play. Yeah, well, yeah. She dunked it, and people were like, oh, my. They couldn't believe it. And so what you did with the, the cross yeah, yeah. is they're really significant moments. Those are re respect moments. I was playing street ball, or I was playing actually at Xavier High School on 13th Street in Manhattan, but there were a lot of NBA guys playing, Charlie Chris, guys maybe you might not have heard of. And so Jane Pauley, the morning show, did yeah. an interview with me, like, what do you do? You're playing against all these NBA guys? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of what I do. Well, this is crazy. Dr. Buss with the Lakers, yeah is watching the morning show. He calls Jerry West in his office and he goes, get her on the phone. So they get my number, they call my house in Far Rockaway and my mother goes, Nancy, some man by the name of Jerry West is on the phone. And I'm like, from the Lakers? I don't wanna to talk to him. He hit that half court shot against the Knicks in 73. <laughs> and my mother goes, I think you should talk to him. I think you him. should answer the phone. So I get on the phone and I go, Hello, he goes, Nancy, uh, this is Jerry West. Yeah, I know, I've seen the logo. And <laughs> he's like, he's like, Dr. Buss, and I would like you to come play for the Lakers in Summer League. He said, we have a new coach for Summer League. His name is Pat Riley. Yep. He came out of, you know, the TV booth. Yeah. And we, he needs some reps yeah. to learn how to coach, you know, for Coach Westhead. 
I'm like, had you seen a woman do this before? Go play for no. a summer league in any NBA? No. So I got on the plane and I got to Loyola Marymount. The trainer, Jack Curran, was really not happy to see me. Mm. He kind of slung a, a Laker mesh bag at me and I'm like, oh boy, this is, I go in the locker room, the guys are naked. And he goes, I said, where, where do I go? And he goes, you go in there. I'm like, yeah, but the guys are there. He goes, you go in there. I have a brother, so I just keep my eyes up and I walk to the back of the locker room and I open up the Laker mesh bag. There's the jersey, mm -hmm. the tube socks, the, you know, the mesh. All your gear that you need. And he put a jock strap in there. And, and so you've been around me long enough. So I go, yo, Jack. And he looks at me, I go, this thing's too small. I'm gonna need something bigger. And the guys in the locker room they lost. were <laughs> laughing. And like, touche, okay. We get into a legendary Pat Riley practice, three hours. Mm -hmm. First of all, he was not happy that I was there. He didn't want really? me, I, in his mind's eye, mm -hmm. I was not his point guard. Mm. His point guard looked different. Mm -hmm. So we get into practice and he'd say, I need five guys. I'd run out on the court. And Mike Tebow was his assistant coach, by okay. the way. Okay. Um, and so I run out there. Every time he says, I need five guys, I was like, I knew I needed to be on the court. I would run his stuff. I'd make a mistake. He would, you know, coach me up. I would get a flow and a rhythm to what he wanted. I'd come off the court and the next five, I'd go, if you don't know how to do that, I do, so I can, I'll be more than happy to help you. So every day I was doing this. So during, they, they, beat, they beat the crap out of me for three hours. Uh -huh. So I didn't know this until like 30 years later when I was in the NBA at a symposium with the Clipper, at the Clippers facility and Pat was talking. Yeah. Nick Nurse is sitting next to me because we coached in the G League together, yeah. and I'm filming it. And Pat goes, so sometimes you never know who you have until you give that person an opportunity. And I'm like, I, I, I have my iPad. He goes, oh, that happened to me back in 1980. And he tells that story. And he says, I didn't want Nancy Lieberman on my team. Mm -hmm. I told the guys, this is my first coaching job and it had to be serious yeah. and I didn't want a sideshow. He goes, wow, she's on the court. She's telling players what to do. She's telling them where to go, how, how to set the screen. He goes, they beat her up. She never cried and she tried to start two fist fights. And this is in the coach's locker room. And yeah. he goes, who the heck does she think she is? She acts like she's the best player on the, on the court. And the next day we go to, and, and Nick goes, you played? I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to listen, please. And I'm like, filming it, I have it on film. Yeah. I'll, I'll just send it to you. I have it on film and he goes, and then four days later, she was my starting point guard because she could run my offense for me. And all the guys were so protective of her. And he goes, the guys were protective of you. I'm like, can you stop talking? <laughs> He's telling a story. <laughs> and we let the we're, man talk. Let the man talk. <laughs> <laughs> and Nick and I are good friends. And um, he's like, Nancy, you changed my life. And I went, I did? And he goes, you stop. He's telling I changed his life. And so. You're ruining my moment. <laughs> <laughs> how did you change? And I'm like, he goes, I, you were, they were bigger. They were stronger. Mm -hmm. They were faster. They were more athletic. There was never a day that you were afraid. You came ready. You, he goes, you were so outmatched, but you never saw that. Mm -mm. And he said, you know, like when I was coaching the Lakers or the Knicks, sometimes I'd be in the huddle and it would be like a pressure situation. He said, I used to think I can do this because I just watched what she did. And I'm like, I'm like choking up that Pat Riley Look, is telling this story. He goes, sometimes the person you don't think can be on your team and bring your culture and your players together might not look the way you think they should look. Mm. And he says, isn't that Nancy? We went to the playoffs and what happened on the last day? Everybody put their hand in and said, one, two, three, Nancy. And I, I was like, 
And he goes, say, that's, did we not discuss this? <laughs> please, Nick, please. Just because I beat you in the G League, you cannot be disturbing me. <laughs> I have a one and so no record video, against him. In the, in the iPad video, we're going to hear Nick Nurse whispering in the background the whole time. And he's still mad that we beat him at the showcase in the G League. I'm like, Nick, if you, if you would have like made some adjustments. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And so... Oh, okay. I have so many questions, but from the, imagine if you had been timid, been intimidated, just tried to stay in your lane. Imagine how different that would have gone in that moment. Like the fact that you did go out there, hold your ground, try to start two fist fights. I was just setting a tone <laughs> that whatever comes my way is coming back. Uh -huh. I just, because, you know, if a dog senses you're afraid, they're going to come at you. It's like and, a shark in water. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted them to know you might beat me up. Yeah. But I'm going to be in the fight. And that's how my life has gone. Yeah. Even, I'll tell you a, a, a quick story. So the, uh, in 80, 86, 87, I played summer league for the Utah Jazz. Mm. And Frank Layton was my coach. Mm -hmm. And I can't, now, now I'm, you know, I'm, not 22 years old, I'm 26, 27. I come down and Mark Eaton, you know, big Mark Eaton yep. is like yelling at me, give me the ball, give me the ball, give me the ball. And I'm like coming down and I'm scared. So I give him, I give him uh, the ball and his feet are moving, he bumbles, he stumbles, he loses it. Frank calls timeout, Frank Layton, and he goes, you will never play for me again. You tell him to get his feet set on the block. And when he's set, you give him the basketball. And, uh, and he goes, Nancy, you will not play another game for the Jazz if you don't do your job. Wow. He was tough on me. Yeah, yeah. We come down. We're playing against um, Carl Malone and Tom Chambers uh -huh. and Danny Vran. I mean, great players. Right. I'm coming down the floor. And, you know, Eaton's yelling at me, give me the ball, give me the ball. I'm like get on the block. He's like, don't tell me what to do. I'm like, get on the block. I'll give you the ball. If not. So he's, he's yelling at me. Well, so I took the time. ball and reversed it. And he was, he was yelling at me during the play. Yeah. So it came back. So we had a timeout and I said, Mark, here's the situation. It's my job to get the ball to the players in the right place, the right situation within what coach wants. I will not give you the ball the rest of the game unless you hustle down the floor, you get, you know, balanced where you can do your job. Yeah. And I gave him the ball, he turned, he dunked, he came down, he tried to give me a high five, he almost broke my arm. <laughs> Frank was really happy. And the other thing that happened in that league in 87, which really kind of ticked me off, was that um, somebody threw a pass, it got you know, somebody jumped the passing lane on the side. I'm running down. It's a two on one and it's Carl Malone and I think Danny Vrains who played in the league. So I just get there and I'm ready. And it, it was like I closed my eyes mm -hmm. as Carl went up and I'm thinking this is going to hurt. Ouch. He jumped over me. It was so quiet. <laughs> There was like 5,000 people in the gym. And he, I'm like, this is taking forever. Maybe I'm dead. <laughs> you like open one eye. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm like, he dunked it. And I go, don't you ever do that to me again. <laughs> you knock me down. Oh don't you gosh. ever jump over me again. And he was like, I didn't want to hurt you. It's like, don't worry you, about me. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, Carlin, like, when I see him at the All-Star party this week, I'll remind him. Just knock me down right now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you forget what yeah. I told you. Y you know, Paris, um, for all the younger players of yesteryear, the Lucy Harris's, the Cheryl Miller's, the Donovan's, uh, the Myers, the Lynette Woodard's, we were fighting the fight yeah. for your generation. We didn't know we were fighting the fight, but like when you came out of school you expected to have a WNBA? I, when I was born, 1997, the first year of the WNBA, the year that you were drafted to the Mercury. I was 39. 
incredible. I don't know a world without a WNBA. I prayed for WNBA. 1985, David Stern called me and asked me to come to New York to meet with him. And I was like, oh my gosh, the commissioner. So I fly to New York. I'm sitting in his office. He closes the door. That's why I love this man. Mm. And he goes, Nancy, it is a pleasure to meet you. And I was like, thank you, sir. He says, look, before my time is done here with the NBA, mm -hmm. there's going to be a W. And I went, what? This is 1985. Oh, wow. This is way before. Yeah. He says, there will be a WNBA. He says, I have one hope. And I said, what is it? He goes, I hope you're still around. And I was like 27. I go, of course I'll be around. Like, you don't see yourself being 39. No. no. He goes, yeah, Nancy, I just hope you'll still be around when it starts. And I, I again, it's so hard to really understand what that means. Yeah. We were playing um, in June, June 14th. I believe of um, 1997 at um, it was America West Arena at the time okay. opening night for the WNBA uh, and it was crazy sold out 17,000 and um, Incredible. you know uh, they're singing the national anthem it's on a national TV game and uh, there I am and that morning, I'm in the house with my husband and, and my son, and uh, the phone rings, and it's David Stern. And David is visibly um, emotional on the call. And he goes, Nancy, I had to pick up the phone to call you today because I'm so proud of you. Mm. I am so proud that you're here. I didn't know if it would happen. Mm. And... Um, I mean, I couldn't believe he would, it meant that much to him. You know, think about it, 85 to 97. So I'm in the arena, it's just buzzing. Yeah. TJ's, you know, two and a half, three years old. Oh, TJ, yeah, yeah. And uh, he's wearing a number 10, a Lieberman Klein jersey. I wore the headband, he's wearing a headband, and I had hurt my finger in practice, so the trainer just put tape, yeah, yeah. TJ has tape on his finger. And we're coming down the court one time, Michelle Timms, the Australian, and you hear this voice go, Timsy, give the ball to my mommy. And I looked at her and I said, give the ball to the kid's mother. <laughs> you listen to that <laughs> And she gave me the ball and I hit a three point shot. And, he, oh. and I heard him going, that's my mommy. That's my mommy. It, it about made me cry on of the court. Course. You just named a couple of really gratifying moments. The, the moment where Pat Riley is telling the story of you in, the, in that Lakers camp, the, the story of, of playing in that WNBA game and David Stern showing his gratitude. Did you have one for, for coaching too? Because I mean, you broke barriers there too. I am thankful to Donnie Nelson. So I remember getting up, I get up early anyway, it's about seven in the morning and you know, there's a blue box for mail and it's about a couple, maybe a mile from my house. I get up and I'm throwing mail in and coming out of Starbucks is Donnie Nelson and Rolando Blackman. And Roe and I have been friends, we're Brooklyn kids, and you know, he played for years for the Mavs. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I just read that Donnie bought that expansion team, or not expansion, but uh, uh, D-League team. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe Roe's gonna be the head coach. This is gonna be fantastic. So we're getting out and he says, hey girl, how you doing? And you know, he was coaching with the Suns when I was a Mercury. And he goes, girl, you, you, you still have your same number? And I was like, yes, sir. And he calls me like that night. He goes, so can you meet me at Starbucks tomorrow? And I go, yeah. He goes, I, I would like you to be the co head coach of my team. And I go, Really? I go, you know you're just gonna get nailed doing that. I mean, the media people, he goes, Nancy, 
I went home after I saw you yesterday morning, and my um, my wife and my daughter were in the kitchen, and they're like, "So, Dad, you know, who are you going to hire?" And he goes, "Maybe the best man for the job isn't a man." I am thankful to Nick Nurse, mm -hmm. to Darvin Ham, to Eric Musselman, mm -hmm. to Del Harris, to Chris Finch. I am grateful for all those men who wanted to, most of them, not Del Harris, but to kick my butt, but would call me and check in on me after games, who after we would play, we would sit and, and grab a meal together. They were so protective of me. Mm -hmm. And I'm really grateful. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm grateful that they're in my life. My first year, it's a 50 game schedule. Okay. It's a lot of games. Yeah. So it's a lot of locker room, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> so I asked Antonio Daniels. Wow. He played for me. I said, Antonio, you won a championship in 99, right? He goes, yeah. I said, could you do me a favor? Can you bring the ring? And I wore the ring on my necklace. Mm -hmm. I wanted everybody to see what a championship ring looks like and that this man had a story to tell. Yeah. We're playing the Austin Toros, the Spurs G League team. Mm -hmm. That day, after shoot around, they're coming in, Pop sent down Danny Green and Corey Joseph. Our players are like, you got to be kidding. We are down nine points in regulation with 11 seconds to go. We're down nine points. Nine with 11. We have the ball. We do up a play. Boom, boom, boom. We score three. We foul Corey immediately. Okay. He goes to the foul line in front of my bench. He misses both foul shots. We get the rebound, we call timeout. How much time is left? Six seconds. We down six, six down seconds. Six. Okay. Draw up a play. R Rashad McCants. Yep. Draw a play for him. And uh, Rashad, just go in the corner. Just sit there. You'll get it. The ball's coming to you. Don't just stay in the corner. Well, you know, I, trust me. Just go to the corner. We run just a quick boom, boom, boom. We throw. It was a Pistons play called Fade, okay. that they ran with Grand Hill and mm -hmm. Joe Dumars. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, um, Doug Collins gave it to me, and I drew a fade. Yeah. Boom, boom, f a sideline play. He hit the three. We're down three with six seconds okay. or four seconds four to go. Seconds. We foul Corey. He, he miss misses both foul shots. We call timeout. I run a play for Booker Woodfox. Great shooter from Creighton. Okay. Buzzer. He hits it. Oh my goodness. So overtime. We go to overtime. We're immediately down seven. It's a two minute overtime. I'm like, we can't be doing this again. <laughs> We're down seven. Same thing. We're yeah. just, I mean, uh, whatever play in my little brain I could draw, <laughs> I was drawing. We win by six. Unbelievable. Go in the locker room go in the locker room, I pick up my phone, and Donnie Nelson hits me, and, he, and I hear it. He goes, Coach, I know it was a great year. Don't worry about the loss. And then he goes, uh, delete this. <laughs> and he goes, how the heck did we win? Uh, sorry about that last message. <laughs> oh, my God. And, you shocked everybody. And we're in the locker room, and the players are, like, looking around, and I'm like, every huddle. We wanted to be the team with the most physical touches. Mm. If you were mad at me, yeah, and I, I, I took you out of the game, just walk by me and just don't look at me, but just tap <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Just so we were know we were connected. Yeah. Every time out, I didn't give a big. It was like, like put your hand out. Mm -hmm. Legends playoffs. That's it. Legends playoffs. Every sideline, every end of game. It could have been legends playoffs. Right. We all said it. So. You put stuff into the universe. Touches. Yeah, meaningful touches add up, and especially at that like. And we made the playoffs, and they didn't. Yeah. On the fiftieth game of the year, at their place, NBA coaches were calling me, going, "Can I get those three plays?" Wow. I'm like, 
yeah, I mean, somebody gave them to me. I right. didn't like make them up. Right. I said, I'm not from New York. I steal everything. <laughs> and you tweak them to your personnel. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Uh, but I don't think I've ever like said, oh, let me tell you what I did. Right. That's like the kiss of death. You can't, n nobody who's been great has ever done it by themselves. At what point did you go to Sacramento with the Kings? I was doing TV here. Really? Um, I had done three years of TV here. And I'm in the gym with Dale Harris and, and TJ of Plano West. And my phone rings. And I'm like, who's this? And I'm like, hello. He goes, Nancy, it's Vade Divats. I'm like, hey, how are you? And he goes, we want to hire you to be assistant coach on the team. I was like, You're, because they let me volunteer at Summer League. Mm -hmm. He goes, it was smooth, it was seamless, you work, you work hard. I mean, I like Vlade, I'm about to cry. I, I mean, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Next call, Lonnie, is Muhammad there? Can you put this on speaker? Muhammad Ali is in Phoenix, he's been telling me for years, Nancy, you gonna be coaching in the NBA. Here we go again. Look. First, you know God. Now you're telling me what I'm going to be doing. And she goes, Nancy, he's acting like he's shooting. And I'm like, Muhammad, stop. You know you can't shoot. And you're still upset that I've come out of retirement more oh than goodness. you. That's how we were. Yeah, and she's yeah. like, Nancy, he's been waiting all day to talk to you. I'm like, I have good news. And she goes, what? I said, I just got hired by the Sacramento Kings. And she goes, we're going to be at your first game in Phoenix. I was like, you are? And they were. And he took pictures with everybody. And it was so cool because like he's in the box and like players are like, the champ is here. And Rondo goes, yeah, it's coach's friend. Yeah. He's here for Nancy. <laughs> it was the, but he was so kind to That's our incredible. players. Yeah. So I, I just owe such a, a great debt of gratitude to Vlade uh, for giving me the opportunity to mm. grind. You know, I, there was one coach I couldn't beat to the facility every morning. I, I was there at 637 every morning, but we had an assistant, uh, like, advisor, and he was there, like, at 5 in the morning. And I was like, ah, I'm, I can't be there at 5 in the morning. But I always wanted to be the first one. Yeah. And I think I was giving my per diem to, you know, our video coordinators, like, what's that called? Uh, that's Synergy. Uh, that's Sports Code. It's what? And, the, and I have to make movies and do Matrix. Film and code I and didn't, stats. I, yeah. I didn't go through that. Yeah. And I was just, oh, I felt so much pressure in Sacramento because people knew me. Yeah. But then I had to do my job. Yeah. And, you know, I'd get calls middle of the night. Hello? Because, you know, you, you naturally morph into, like, I had Bellinelli. Um, I had Rondo. I had Rudy Gay, okay. yeah. um, you know, the guys that I was warming up and yeah. working with and cutting film for. Rondo, one of the smartest guys I've ever been around. You're my phone. My players, I'm like, hi, hi, Rajan. He goes, Coach, you watching film? Uh, yeah, it was in my last dream. Why? <laughs> Half asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, can you open up your computer? I said, I, I was hoping you would ask. Mm -hmm. And now... You can't think the way you think. You have to think the way Rondo the thinks. thinks yeah. And I'm like, what is he looking for? He goes, look at the film at like 418 of the fourth quarter. I'm like, okay. So I'm watching the, the pin down from Willie Colley uh, Stein, uh, you know, to let Bellinelli. And he comes off and he's got the one-footed yeah. arc shot and the spacing. And I'm like, is it the defense? And I'm like, oh, my God. The bench is jumping up and down. DeMarcus is waving a towel. Quincy Ace, they're all, you know, Darren Collison. And I go, Rondo, we're a team. We care about each other. He goes, Coach, yes, we care about each other. Look at everybody so excited for Bellinelli. Yeah. He just, he, he he's a special guy. Yeah. Um, he's demand, like he'll come in his recall and he'll go, well, there were 17 seconds on the clock. It was Boston. There was, you know, 
uh, it was sold out. It was, uh, you know, 63rd game of the year. Uh, Hugh Hollins was the official, and um, Delaney was on the right side, and the, Hugh was in the slot. And I'm like, okay, you're weird. <laughs> and he says, and, you know, we ran this little corner rub, and, you know, Glenn Davis came off of it, but it really, it was just for distraction of eyes. It was false action. And then, you know, it was, it was really for Garnett. Yeah. He, he knew the time, the side of the floor, the referees. You better be on your game. There are players in this league. They are sharper than sharp. Like, it, it, you know, I look at, at Shea and, and the, you know, Giddy and so many of these players. They are smart. Smart. They know the game. Yeah. The greatest part of their career is it's reps. Mm -hmm. It's watching film, reps, um, course correction. Yep. And then applying it. But the other thing that I realized when I was coaching – and maybe I was a, a newbie. When they were stretching, I would sit, like I would see Ben Mack no more. And I'd look at him and he was, and I'd sit down next to him and stretch. And I'm like, how you doing, Ben? And he's like, yeah, I'm good. I'm like, that is so weird. You have the, like the best smile on the team and I don't see you smiling, what's wrong? And I believe if you pour love and kindness and consideration, they're human beings. They're not just assets. Right. They, they, they have stuff going on in their lives. DeMarcus gets on the jet and he has like 10 bags, like, you know, flowers and Chanel and Dior. And I'm like, okay. And then the next day I was like, you know, you okay? How are the kids? What's going on? Mom coming to the game? Um, you know, if you need anything, I'm here. Like, I'd love to talk to you. Because you're a mom at that point, too. You have that, that eye for those things. Um, and, you know, like, I was very aware yeah. of if somebody was struggling or maybe hadn't played well. You know, look, I coached, uh, Seth Curry was my guy. Mm -hmm. Every day, Seth Curry would come to the gym. He was on a G League contract. Okay. And um, I think San Jose or wherever he was, his brother's crushing it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he comes in there every day, working his, and I was like, you know, Seth, there's going to be a time that you have to see yourself. You know, you have to see it. You have to say it to be it. And he goes, what? You have to see it. You have to see yourself starting. Say it every day. I'm going to be starting in the NBA. I'm going to be a starter in the NBA. So when it happens, mm -hmm. that's where you belong. Mm. And he, every day, he never took off his warm ups. Game 20, game 30, game this, game that. I've said every day, I worked with him before practice every day. I said, you need to practice like you're an all star. Yep. Yeah. It's just and, the same as the just, Legends playoffs. It's the same it, thing. You must do this. And I'm sure he thought I was blowing smoke. And I'd say to him, it's an 82-game schedule. Something's going to happen. Yeah. Somebody might get hurt. We, there might be a playoff situation or, you know, we're trying to move some. I said, you're going you're gonna to have to be ready for your moment. If you're not ready for your moment, then shame on you. Right. Then you shouldn't have those dreams and aspirations. And the last 20 games of the year, we sat Darren Collison and uh, Rondo. Seth started the last 20. He sat like, 57% from three, he shot better than his brother. And he looked at me one day in the locker room and he goes, I, thank you. I mm -hmm. go, no, thank you. Yeah. I'm so proud of you. And these guys, you know, they make enormous amounts of money, um, the status, yeah. and you know, like everybody else, they just want to be loved and cared for. Of course. They just want to know like on their best moment, you're there yeah. organically for them. And on their worst moment, you're there. Yeah. Right. And it's interesting how you use so many different ways as like points of inspiration, right? Like whether it's just showing care, showing some love and attention and reminding someone that they are they are very capable of getting where they want to go just feeding their dream right or just being the person that someone else wants to be like for me like if i wanted to 
play in college. Well, there was a Nancy Lieberman who played in college and played in the NCAA and won championships. And there was a Nancy Lieberman who played in the in the WNBA that you've been able to inspire in a lot of different ways. And now I look I look at the league now and the amount of women on either NBA benches. I look at our bench. We've got Zoe Vernon, who's on staff. We've got Vanessa Brooks, who's part of the medical team. I'm over here on, on the broadcast with you. What I mean, what is how does it feel to see all of the different ways that you've been able to inspire and and pave a way for people? Um, everything that has happened here in Oklahoma City has been done because of ownership. This is their vision. It's their culture. I would never actually thank you, but I could never take credit. I, look, I, 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 I'm clear who I am yeah. at this stage of my life, but that's not what moves me. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to inspire through help, through mm -hmm. love, through my faith, mm -hmm. uh, through, you, you know, I'm a, I'm a dream giver, not a hope stealer. Mm -hmm. I love to coach. I want to get in the gym. I want to break things down. I want to, you know, I want to master, show players that they, they can master the things that take no talent. It actually doesn't take talent to show up. Mm -mm. It doesn't take talent to have a finisher's mentality. Right. And there's, you know, and ahead of everything, it doesn't take talent to be in great shape because if you're not in great shape, you will, you know, fall short of yeah. the mark. But. It's like you don't like like I, I say to guys, I even say it to my son, TJ, you know, who's over in Israel playing. Mm -hmm. TJ, you don't need 30 girlfriends. You just need one team, one girlfriend to fall in love with you in the NBA yeah. or Maccabi Tel Aviv or Jerusalem or, you know, in, in, in Europe. Um, or playing for me last year the in three. the big three. Yeah. And um I, and I actually was very nice. I had the privilege of, of paying my son, and it gave me a reason to yell at him. <laughs> <laughs> For good reason. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, no, I'm, I'm very proud of him. Yeah. You know, I, wherever his journey takes him, it's not been shortcuts. Right. He, you know, you have to have a professional routine and mentality, and you have to respect people. Yep. Uh, it could be the, the janitor. It could be the people, you know, like Dion. Deion Sanders, I went to Jackson State because Deion is my brother and we're inseparable. So I promised him I'd go to the HBC, you know, one of the games. Mm -hmm. And I went in October. And one of the coolest things that D said after their, their game, the guys were in the locker room, they had a bye week. He goes, guys, and this is college. He goes, when you leave here, I'm going to ask you to be respectful. I'm going to ask you to be kind. And, and, you know, understanding, you know, respect with women. I'm going to ask you to not get thrown in jail, arrested. I'm going to ask you to not take anything that doesn't belong to you. I'm going to ask you to not take anything that you think should belong to you. And when you leave here, I'm going to ask you to pick up all your stuff, laundry in a bin, don't leave. These people shouldn't have to come in here and pick up your dirty socks and your soda cans and things like that. Yeah. What a great message. Mm -hmm. What a great message. Some of these guys are going to be in the NFL one day. Right. Uh, and, and he was just like, there's a certain way, like I watch professionalism. professionalism, but you know, every day, like I like to walk around cause I love coming here to OKC, um, and seeing friends, yeah. players, coaches. But um, I watch, um, I watch Shay and, and Dort and all the players really. Yeah. But I have to be honest. I look at Shea, mm -hmm. and every time he finishes his pregame shooting, and he's serious about his craft, the minute he's done, he goes right over to the fans. To the tunnel, and right, so and, much time in the tunnel, and he's not in a hurry. No, there's a reason that young man is blessed. Mm -hmm. I'd love to meet his parents. Because mm -hmm. they gave him some extraordinary values. Yes, I, I, that's what's that's what takes you far. That's what took you far, is putting, being intentional with the people around you, and 
being grateful for the platform and the opportunity that you have. And you still do it to this day. And this, I learned this from you. When we're upstairs in that booth, in the Michelob Ultra Lounge, at the desk, lights are on, TV's going, I'm focused, I'm on my laptop doing stuff, typing away. And a kid comes over, Nancy, Nancy, can we take a picture? John's in our ear, we've got one minute, one minute till air. And you're like, what do you say? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come, come on. right right here. Come on. Sit on my lap. Come right here. Make sure, mom, come take a pic. Yeah. Come get in front of the camera. Get a good, picture. Get a good one. I don't take many good pictures these days. <laughs> but you always take the time. And that's so important. Because I have gratitude. Yeah. I mean, I have confidence, but I, I'm thankful. I have gratitude. Mm -hmm. That's not going to change anytime soon. It's not my birthright to work for the Oklahoma City right. Thunder. Right. It's an honor to work for them. Yeah. It's not my birthright to work with you. It's an honor to work with you and our extraordinary staff from coach down, you know, at the locker room to the people in, you know, when we go get food. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody has a job to do in the success of an organization. And I, I really do respect that. Yeah. I, I, I really do.